my disclosures. So perhaps it's appropriate to begin by saying that cardiovascular risk persists in treated HIV. Uh, in fact, there's a greater atherosclerosis burden after controlling for risk factors. There are more MI and strokes than anticipated. And in fact, it remains a major cause of morbidity and mortality in HIV. Importantly, inflammation appears to be causal. So here's a, a recent study uh, that is currently in press showing that if you look across deciles of calculated risk, ASCVD risk, for example, which most primary care physicians will plug into the calculator, and you can see here that as you go from lower to higher risk, look at the gray single thatch bars, and you can see the graded increased risk that you would expect in a population of patients not living with HIV. Then you take the observed risk of individuals with HIV, and you can see that across these risk deciles, there's a substantial increase in the risk for patients living with HIV above and beyond what would be predicted by their cardiovascular disease risk factors. So what could be driving this? Well, I think it would be appropriate to go to what we already know about atherosclerosis. For decades, in the run-of-the-mill atherosclerotic milieu, we see that inflammation is an important and potent driver of disease. So here's a well-traveled slide from 2002 that really has withstood the test of time. You can see a blood monocyte rolling into the epithelium. And within the endothelium, you can see that there is an ingress of these monocytes. The monocytes express the scavenger receptor and then become tissue macrophages where they then start spewing out reactive oxygen species, as we were talking about just moments ago, MMPs, which will cause structural weakness of the plaque, and all of these things collude to grow the plaque on one hand and also render it structurally weak. We can image this. So here are several aspects of a plaque, uh, taking you into atherosclerosis now. So here's the intima, here's the muscular media, and there are several things that you would expect within the atherosclerotic milieu, including lots of inflammatory cells, and you can see here this, this bulge of inflammation. So how can we image these today? Well, in patients and in animals, there are several different tracers that we can use, but let me take your attention here to fluorodeoxyglucose, which is typically used in oncologic imaging. So glucose enters a cell and is phosphorylated by hexokinase and then goes along its merry way into glycolysis. Fluorodeoxyglucose does the same thing, also gets phosphorylated by hexokinase, and then here becomes metabolically trapped. It can no longer participate in glycolysis, so its accumulation tells us something about the glycolytic rate of cells. We take advantage of this. So clinically, we use it to look at tumors, we can look at it uh, ischemic or hibernating myocardium, and we can look for inflammation. I can give you some examples, but let me tell you about the reason for this. So first, I want to show you um, what would happen if you were just to look at tumors. So if you inject FDG into a mouse model, for example, you'll see that the FDG localizes to tumor cells. I think most clinicians in this room will have seen FDG in tumors over the years because it is the primary way to diagnose the staging uh, of, of tumors. What you might not realize is that so much of the FDG is actually localizing to the inflammatory cells, the tumor-associated macrophages. So in fact, all along, tumor imaging is, in a way, inflammation imaging. And as it turns out, here if you look at If you look at the metabolic activity of a cell, the FDG uptake, and compare it to the pro-inflammatory output of the macrophages, you'll see a very tight correlation. So not only is it telling you something about the number of cells, but also their metabolic activity or their pro-inflammatory potential. So we use that, for example, to look at cardiac sarcoidosis. I'm a cardiologist, so I'm going to give you a cardiology-focused uh, set of infl inflammatory diseases. So here is sarcoidosis. Uh, these are some uh, representative images for perfusion and FDG uptake. And where it's abnormal, there are problems. So for example, here are clinical findings on patients who have abnormal FDG uptake. If it's relatively normal, their outcome is good. If it is abnormal here in red, they have more events such as VT or death. Similarly, we use it for assessing for infections. 
You can look for many different infections, FUOs, for example, but here we can use it to look at pr uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis. You can see the very uh, increased uptake here. It doesn't really take a lot of training to notice that there's a big, what we'll call a goomba, right here in the middle of the chest, and it associates with this mechanical valve. We can also use it to measure inflammation in normal arteries. So here is the heart and the aorta. You can simply put your regions of interest across the aorta and measure backgrounds, get your aortic standard uptake values, as you can see here, and you can get your target to background ratios, very quantitative results. And in fact, those quantitative findings tell you something. Importantly, if you take out the vessels and histologically assess the amount of inflammation, the question is, does your FDG uptake, your target to background ratio, tell you anything? So let me show you two patients with CTs and PETs. Here's the CT, and you can see this person had a tight carotid stenosis. And you can see this white part here in the middle shows you where the blood is flowing to the head. That's abnormal. This person also has tight carotid stenosis. But now look at the FDG signals for these two individuals. This person here has intense red, this is the FDG uptake, and that's gonna give you a high target to background ratio. This person has scant FDG uptake. And if you then look at the histology that comes here, this is first the cross-sectional of, of, of the PET-CT. Here's the lumen, and here's the adjacent intense metabolic activity. Histopathologically, here's the lumen, and here on the side you can see the brown staining for the macrophages. And now if you look at the macrophage density compared to the FDG uptake, very nice correlations. So you can use this to non-invasively assess what the histopathology will later tell you to be inflammation. And several groups have shown this with larger and larger studies yet. There are at least a half a dozen uh, groups that have shown very tight correlations between FDG uptake and inflammation. Now, the inflammation in the artery is gonna tell you something important. For example, here is a study where we obtained baseline PETs and CT. And here in this cartoon, you can imagine, here's a hot spot where there's increased FDG uptake at baseline and another hot spot with increased FDG uptake at baseline. And on this cartoon, in those same hot spots, the CT then blossomed subsequently areas of calcium deposition, indicating plaque progression. And if you look across the entire group, in areas where there was absent subsequent calcium deposition, the FDG uptake was relatively low, whereas if there was future deposition of calcium, the FDG uptake was high. More importantly, the FDG uptake tells you something about risk. So here's a study where we looked at over 500 individuals who didn't have cancer at baseline and who we followed for up to five years. And you can see that there is an increase in the risk of CVD events in individuals with the highest tertile of FDG uptake. Now this is simply measuring the average FDG uptake in the ascending aorta. We're not even specifying the carotids or the coronaries. So this tells you something about the general inflammatory milieu within the atherosclerotic vessels. More importantly, we had some index of the timing of the events so that individuals who had proximal events within six months of imaging had the highest activity, followed by individuals with ladder and ladder events followed by patients without events at all. And then if you look at the net reclassification index, it was a rather robust 29%, meaning that if you took a general risk calculator, took imaging, measured inflammation, you would reclassify accurately 29% of the population. What about changes in FDG uptake? I'm gonna to get to why. So if you're interested in treatment effects, changes make, make a difference. So here's a study where we asked if early changes in FDG uptake, say within six months, make a difference. In this particular study, we had patients who were imaged with both PET and MRI. PET for inflammation, MRI for structure. We had both baseline, EP PET, and MRI. And then for PET, we repeated the study at six months. For MRI, we looked longer term, two years. And we asked if the early changes on PET somehow predicted what was gonna happen structurally over two years. And you can see here that individuals who had change in arterial inflammation by PET, those who had an increase over six months, tended to have more of a progression in the thickness of their vessels, the atherosclerotic milieu. Here you can see about 15 to 
whereas those who had a decrease in arterial inflammation by six months had lack of progression, and it was significantly different between the two. This sets up the concept that you can use changes in imaging over time to predict, possibly, interventions that will alter progression of disease. So let's see how well this pans out. So far, there are five drug classes for which we have both PET-CT data and clinical endpoint data. How well do the findings correlate? So first, I can show you about statins. We all know that statins are miraculously effective. At least cardiologists are telling everyone about that. And you can see that there is a nice reduction in arterial inflammation with low-dose statins, and it's even greater, twice as great for high-dose statins. And in fact, that's what we'll find in endpoint trials. In general, high-dose statins are about twice as effective as low-dose statins in terms of reducing cardiovascular disease events. Also, TZDs are very effective at reducing uh, arterial inflammation. Here you can see pioglitazone when compared, for example, to glimepiride, which doesn't really adequately reduce arterial inflammation, although it does reduce uh, blood glucose to a similar level. And similarly, when you compare TZDs to other um, here, primarily uh, glimepiride, there is a substantial uh, reduction in the relative risk of cardiovascular disease events. So far, so good. Two positive studies on imaging, two positive studies in terms of the clinical endpoints. Well, let me show you some neutral studies. Here is a study that looked at a CETP antagonist showing no effect on arterial inflammation. And here, 16,000 patients later, there is no effect on clinical endpoints either. Here's another study where we saw no change of any of the predefined or exploratory endpoints on imaging, and 16,000 patients later, no change in clinical endpoints. So, so far, so good. There seems to be a correlation between imaging trials and cardiovascular disease endpoint trials. So, assessment of arterial inflammation is well validated. It can enhance cardiovascular disease risk stratification and can provide insights into efficacy of treatments. What about insights into mechanisms of disease? So here's a study where we looked at the arterial milieu in individuals living with HIV. And here are examples. Here's a patient living with HIV. This is the intense uptake that we will subsequently be able to measure. And here's what it looks like up and down the uh, aorta. Here is a person who is age and gender matched and also matched by Framingham risk score. And you can see there's substantially less activity. When we look at the entire population, individuals living with HIV have substantially greater arterial inflammation compared to matched controls. And we found that the degree of arterial inflammation also tracked with markers of monocyte activation in those patients. Moreover, we found that the arterial inflammation in the ascending aorta actually gave us insights into what was going on in the coronaries. Let me just quickly walk you through that. So we can measure the um, plaques in the coronaries by looking at low attenuation plaques. In other words, let me just translate that and call them plaques with a lot of lipids. So if we look at the lumps and bumps in the artery wall and look for low attenuation or lipid-rich plaques, those are the most dangerous types of plaques uh, in, in uh, individuals without blockages. So we found that if you look at FDG uptake, it was increased in individuals who have those types of tracks, plaques. In other words, individuals that have what looks like this, a lot of arterial inflammation, tend to have on CT what looks like this. Here's a plaque, which if you just look at this, the, the vessel in white, the, the lumen, it looks pretty innocuous. But if you look just outside into the wall, you can see this big bulging area of lipid, and those are the ones that tend to rupture and cause myocardial disease, such as uh, MI. The next question we asked is whether or not the atherosclerotic inflammation is driven by viral disease activity. So we started looking at this in several different ways, and one of the ways we became quite interested in is looking at the lymph nodes. We can very easily measure lymph node activity. And here you can see uh, intense FDG uptake in the lymph nodes of an individual living with HIV. If you were a radiologist, you'd probably look at that and worry about uh, a tumor. And what I can tell you is that if you compare controls, individuals who are um, suppressed untreated or treated suppressed versus untreated individuals unsuppressed, those 
who are untreated and unsuppressed have very, very high activity such as this, um, and there's a graded increase across those categories. And what we then found is that the lymph node activity actually associates with things such as viral load, CD4, CD8 count, et cetera. In other words, measures of viral disease activity, but not so much with measures of monocyte uh, and, and systemic inflammation. On the other hand, arterial inflammation didn't associate with viral disease activity, but did with monocytes and systemic inflammation. So these differences already give us an insight or predict to us that maybe treating the viral load itself might not pay off the way we'd want it to in terms of changing the arterial inflammatory milieu. And in fact, we tried that. So here uh, is a study where we took individuals who are now being newly treated with ART. And here is one patient. You can see the very intense axillary activity before, and here is after ART. You can see how there is diminution here, extinction actually, of this signal. And here are the group results. You can see very clearly uh, almost all the patients had a reduction in the lymph node activity before versus after uh, treatment, whereas arterial inflammation didn't go down. There was a slight hint of its going up, in fact. So that doesn't seem very promising. What might work? Well, we've looked at a few things, and let's begin by getting lessons from chronic atherosclerotic disease. So currently, there are two big trials looking at anti-inflammatory approaches in patients with chronic atherosclerosis. Those trials excluded individuals with chronic inflammatory conditions, including HIV. But in this context, there is Cantos, which has looked at kenicunumab, an IL-1 beta antagonist, and CERT, which is looking at low-dose methotrexate. CERT was stopped early. The results are still pending. We'll find out in hopefully a handful of months what the answer is. But we already have some insights because uh, the ACTG A5314 study looked at the impact of methotrexate on arterial inflammation in, in patients living with HIV. And you can see here that individuals with placebo versus low-dose methotrexate, and you look at the histograms of the individual patient responses, actually, there's no difference. So the primary endpoint, the change in the TBR, did not differ between the two groups. A secondary endpoint, which looked at the change in SUV, had a minuscule difference that uh, barely reached significance. And if you look at these two bar graphs, uh, I think if I can summarize my senses, it eh, doesn't really seem like there's much of an effect at all. No harm, but no uh, appreciable effect. The other study is the Cantos trial. Now, that was the IL-1 beta antagonist with canicunumab, and that worked like gangbusters in terms of reduction of cardiovascular disease endpoints. It reduced cardiovascular disease by 15%. And look at this there was also a very nice reduction in some oncologic endpoints as well, namely lung cancer. So very promising drug. Uh, FDA is currently looking at that. We should hear something hopefully uh, over the next several weeks in terms of whether or not this drug will be FDA approved. But here's what we saw in HIV in a small pilot study designed first to look at safety, and there's an ongoing arm right now looking at uh, larger impacts. This is what we found. So first, what we did in this particular study is we did uh, FDG PET imaging. We also looked at uh, monocyte uh, phenotypes and monocyte behavior. So first, canicunumab nicely reduced the percentage of monocytes producing IL-1 beta. I guess no surprise here. It also reduced the uh, arterial inflammatory signal and the percent of monocytes producing IL-6. So this is a much more interesting and promising uh, result. We'll have to see how well this works uh, and what the side effect profile in HIV looks like. Again, the study is still ongoing, but we should find out, uh, hopefully within a couple of years, what, what uh, canicunumab offers in treatment of individuals living with HIV. What about statins? So of course, statins are, as I said before, very potent at reducing arterial inflammation. We did a study in individuals uh, without HIV, comparing uh, torvastatin 10 versus 80, did serial PET-CT imaging, and as I showed before, there was a nice reduction in both uh, low-dose and high-dose statins with 
twice as much of a reduction in high-dose statins. I also want to mention that statins not only reduce the signal and the arterial inflammatory signal in the aorta, but also in the coronary arteries. So for, uh, primarily, in fact, most of the reduction we saw in the coronary occurred in the lipid-rich plaques. And that's interesting and important because statins do reduce the plaque volume in non-calcified plaques in HIV. In a study that we published a couple of years ago, here individuals who were treated with placebo had a slight progression in their plaques, in the non-calcified plaques, whereas individuals living with HIV who were treated with atorvastatin had a nice reduction in the non-calcified plaques. We're still waiting to see the impact of statins on atherosclerotic disease events, and we await the findings of reprieve. Thank you for your attention.